Coming up on the Ultimate Health Podcast. This idea that you should eat all the time, it's a relatively new idea. If you grew up in the 70s, because I grew up in the 70s, and you wanted an after-school snack, your mom would say, no, you're going to ruin your dinner. And if you wanted a bedtime snack, your mom would say, no, you should have ate more at dinner. And so snacking was actively discouraged. Now we have this idea that, hey, you have to snack all day long. So we tell our kids, oh, have a snack here, have a a mid-morning snack, have an after-school snack, have a snack between the halves of soccer. And then we go, I wonder why they're gaining weight. It's like because you're shoving them into this fat storage mode all the time. Hello and welcome to the Ultimate Health Podcast, episode 369. I'm Jesse Chappis, and I'm here to take your health to the next level. Each week, I'll bring you inspiring and informative conversations about health and wellness, covering topics of nutrition, lifestyle, fitness, mindset, and so much more. And this week, Dr. Jason Fung is on the show. He's a physician, author, and researcher. His groundbreaking science-based books about diabetes and obesity, The Diabetes Code, The Obesity Code, and The Complete Guide to Fasting have sold hundreds of thousands of copies and challenged the conventional wisdom that diabetics should be treated with insulin. Dr. Fung is also the co-founder of the Intensive Dietary Management Program, which is North America's leading clinic to help people lose weight and reverse type 2 diabetes naturally with fasting. His work has been cited by CNN, Time, The Atlantic, Forbes, The Toronto Star, and many other media outlets. And this conversation is based off his book, Life in the Fasting Lane. He co-wrote this book with Eve Mayer and Megan Ramos. And my biggest takeaway was the negative impact of quote-unquote healthy snacking and the importance of trying to get back to three solid meals a day. Our bodies can only exist in one of two states, fed after we've eaten or fasted when we've not eaten. And when we're fed, our body wants to store energy. When fasted, the body wants to burn stored food energy. So if you're having trouble getting to or maintaining your goal weight, this one fact could be a total game changer for you. Some of the highlights from today's show are the real reason people gain weight are hormones, the physiology of what happens while fasting, the fasting differences between men and women, training in the fasted state, and Dr. Fung's current fasting protocol. Lots of great stuff in this one. I know you're going to love it. And if you do, I'd really appreciate it if you could help spread the word, share this one with somebody in your life, a friend, a family member, and I thank you ahead of time. Without further ado, here I go with Dr. Jason Fung. Hello, Jason. Welcome to the podcast. Oh, thanks for having me on. We're going to have a great chat. I loved your latest book that you co-wrote with Eve and Megan, and this is titled Life in the Fasting Lane. I'm curious just to start, how does somebody who's a kidney specialist get so interested in fasting as a subject? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that what happened is that um, as a kidney specialist, what I do is I see a lot of type 2 diabetics. And as we've had this sort of increasing obesity epidemic since the 1970s, That sort of was followed by an epidemic of type 2 diabetes starting in the late 1980s, 1990s. And then uh, type 2 diabetes is actually far and away the most common cause of kidney disease. So as, uh, you know, we went into the 2000s and 2010s, we started to see much more and more of type 2 diabetes related kidney disease. So I actually encountered it quite a bit. And as it became more and more important, Part of my practice, I started to think about weight loss because the entire way that we treat, um, you know, disease is sort of backwards. That is, if you look at type two diabetes-related kidney disease, for example, we spend a lot of money and effort trying to design drugs and dialysis and all this sort of stuff. However, the actual treatment doesn't make sense because if you have kidney disease from type two diabetes, well, the answer is to how to get rid of it is it's telling you right there. If you have if you don't have type 2 diabetes, then you can't get diabetic related kidney disease. And if you lose weight, your type 2 diabetes will get better. So the real answer to this whole problem lies in getting to the root cause, which is the weight. If you lose weight, then you don't get the type 2 diabetes, you don't get the kidney disease. And that's really the only good way, you know, to treat the disease. Yet as a medical profession, Nobody was interested in weight loss, and to a large extent, nobody is really interested. Like we sort of gave up this entire concept, which is so important, so fundamental to human health, because this is what we face in North America today. 
a lot of problems of, of uh, type 2 diabetes and obesity. And we gave it up to like, you know, Weight Watchers and Jenny Craig and all those sort of things. It's like, uh, that's fine, but it's really an important subject. So that's when I started to look at the question of weight loss. And uh, when I looked at it, it was clear that there wasn't a lot of really good thinking in the area. The entire field was dominated by sort of calories in, calories out theory. That is, you know, we've all heard this before, you know, it's just a matter of eating fewer calories and exercising more. It's like, if you actually think about it for a little bit, it actually makes very little sense. Uh, That is, you know, it's a very sort of uh, simplistic argument because the question is not whether people are eating more calories or burning less calories. The question is sort of why are they eating more calories and why are they not burning as many calories? And it turns out that the real answer to why we're gaining weight is more likely related to our hormones than the number of calories we're eating. As an example, you can eat two different foods of the same, you know, the same number of calories. So you could eat broccoli or you could drink soda, sugary soda. Well, it's very easy to gain weight if you're drinking soda, uh, but almost nobody gains weight eating broccoli. So the point is that for two foods that are the same calories, they're completely different. And the minute you put it in your mouth, the hormonal response to those two foods is completely and utterly different. So if the hormones are different, the hormonal instructions that we deliver to our body are going to be completely different. So a simple example is satiety. If you drink sugary soda, there's almost no satiety signaling. You don't feel full from drinking sugary soda. Yet if you eat a large number of calories of broccoli or steak or any sort of real natural food, you will get full. So that's a simple example of how the body responds to these calories. Two foods of equal calories, but a totally different response from our bodies. And therefore, what's important is not just the number of calories, but this sort of hormonal response. And that's, you know, that's what I I, I talk about a lot of is this sort of trying to get to the root cause of what causes weight gain rather than this very, very simplistic sort of calories in, calories out model which to be honest, hasn't really helped anybody. That is, it's been the standard sort of advice for uh, doctors and dietitians and everybody to count your calories, but yet it, it almost helps nobody. So, you know, here we have a treatment, which is counting calories and doing calorie restricted diets, which has a failure rates probably on the order of 99%. So it's like, why would that be a standard treatment if the failure rate's like 99%? And we, it's not just my opinion. You see it in the numbers. Like the numbers don't lie. There's more and more obesity out there. People who try to lose weight, they count their calories and they don't lose weight. So it's not a very good strategy from all sort of from all angles. Well, let's take your example there of the soda versus the broccoli and get a little bit deeper into the weeds here. And you mentioned the hormonal differences in the body when those different foods, we'll call them, are consumed. So take us through those two examples and talk about the hormonal response in each. So if you eat, um, say, any real food, so broccoli or steak or eggs or whatever, these are foods that our bodies have been sort of equipped to handle. We know what these foods are and we've always eaten them. So when you eat that food, so there's usually a combination of uh, carbohydrates, uh, proteins, and fats, and it induces certain hormonal responses. So the proteins and the fats, for example, will you know stimulate us to produce things like peptide YY and cholecystokinin, which are satiety hormones. And they're very powerful. That's why when you go and eat a very big meal, For example, uh, you know, those steakhouses that give you a free steak if you can eat a 60 ounce steak or whatever, they don't give away a lot of free steak because when you're trying to eat it, your body uh, won't allow you. So these satiety signals are very powerful. And if you try to eat more, you'll throw up. So those are some of the responses. When you eat something like cookies or, or, um, you know, soda or something, you get almost purely carbohydrate, uh, sugar and other carbohydrates. And what you get is a very, very strong insulin effect. So insulin is essentially the hormone that tells our body to store that energy. And the way that we store energy is, amongst other things, body fat. So when you eat a food like steak or something or broccoli then or salad, what you're going to get is sort of this mixed signaling, a little bit of insulin, which is going to store some of the energy, 
but it's also going to use a lot of that energy and you're also going to uh, feel full after a while and then you're going to stop eating. If you eat cookies and drink Coca-Cola, for example, what you're going to get is almost no satiety. So you can keep drinking it as long as you want and you're going to get a lot of insulin signaling. So all of those calories are essentially shuttled right into your storage or body fat. So it's a completely different thing because remember, when you're taking in calories, your body can either burn it or it can store it. Which one it does depends on the hormonal signals that we get from that food. So when you overeat a certain type of food, that is carbohydrate-heavy foods, that is refined carbohydrates for the most part. Because if you eat unrefined carbohydrates, there's other things. So something like beans, for example, which is very carbohydrate-heavy, also contains a lot of bulk. So one of the things, if you eat a lot of beans, you're going to stretch your stomach. There are stretch receptors in the stomach, which is, again, signal satiety. But if you eat a lot of sort of highly refined things like white bread and cookies and soda pop, then you're not getting that bulk. You're not getting the satiety signaling, and you're getting a heck of a lot of insulin signaling. So that's the main thing is that sort of insulin signaling, because it's not so much the number of calories, it's the way that our body uses those calories. That is really the important thing to look at. And uh, this sort of focus, sort of this obsessive focus on the number of calories hasn't really helped. Let's take uh, an example, like do a thought experiment. Say you eat uh, cookies all day, you know, and you normally eat 2,000 calories, but now you decide that you're just going to snack on cookies all day and it'll be 1,500 calories all day. Well, because you're just signaling insulin very, very heavily, all those 1,500 calories are going to be sort of shuttled into storage. Well, that leaves you with no energy for your body to use because you've given your body the instruction to store it all. So then your body has no energy, so it's actually going to naturally decrease its energy expenditure. So that is, you're going to feel cold, you're going to feel tired, and eventually you're going to stop losing weight, which is exactly what happens. As opposed to something like uh, if you're eating sort of natural foods, you know, things that are very close to the way they are in nature, you're going to get a much different message to your body of how to use it. And one way to hack it in order to get us to start using body fat is the fasting. Uh, so this is uh, what happened was what, as I started to think about this idea of how are you going to get your body to use up the body fat? Because it's not a matter of energy. Okay, Everybody pretends it's about calories. So your body, if you're overweight, you probably have like two, 300,000 calories of body fat on you. So it's not a matter that you don't have the calories. It's a matter that you're not getting any access to those calories. Okay, and that's the big problem because you, you've stored away all of these calories. And one of the things that insulin does is it blocks you from using it. Remember, insulin is the signal that tells you to store calories. You're not going to burn calories because you're trying to store it. So therefore, if your insulin is always high because you're eating cookies all day, then you're going to keep those calories that are in your body fat locked away and you're not going to be able to lose weight or at least lose body fat. And something I want to highlight there too, you use the cookie example, which is obviously a food that's detrimental to our health, but there would also be a negative impact too if we were snacking on healthy things like even vegetables or fruit or nuts, because you're going to be constantly spiking that insulin. And like you've already explained, when the insulin is spiked, we're going to be in energy storing mode. So even if you're eating healthy, you might realize that you just continue to pack on the pounds. Absolutely. And this is the thing that's really important is that this idea that you should eat all the time, it's a relatively new idea. If you grew up in the 70s, because I grew up in the 70s, and you wanted an after school snack, your mom would say, no, you're going to ruin your dinner. And if you wanted a bedtime snack, your mom would say, no, you should have ate more at dinner. And so snacking was actively discouraged. Now we have this idea that, hey, you have to snack all day long. So we tell our kids, oh, have a snack here, have a, a mid-morning snack, have an after-school snack, have a snack between the halves of soccer. And then we go, I wonder why they're gaining weight. It's like because you're shoving them into this fat storage mode all the time. The entire reason for us to have body fat is a store of calories, right? It's like a bear. It gets fat because it needs to store calories for the winter. So fat is, allows us 
to store some calories. That's the reason you don't die in your sleep every single night, because we can store some of this food energy, which is calories away, and then release it as we need it. When you eat it, you put your body into this fat storage mode. When you don't eat or when you're fasting, you're going to put your body into this sort of fat burning mode where you're using up calories. So you're either storing calories or you're burning calories. They can't do both at the same time. And that's why it's really important to focus on this sort of uh, idea of how are you going to get your hormones in line so that you're actually using up those calories. You know, one of the ways is fasting, which is really just an extension of what we were talking about, which is just allowing your insulin to fall and allowing your body access to those stores of body fat. And I'll, I'll just say one other thing in terms of the calories, like cookies and the other thing. So there's always these people that always say, oh, he's a calorie denier. And it's like the whole implication that different calorie foods have different hormonal responses. The only thing practically that is the implication is that some foods, are more fattening than others, which is just pure common sense. Like I'm not trying to deny that calories, calories are just a unit of energy, right? But it means that certain foods like cookies and soda are going to be more fattening than broccoli and eggs. And that's just the truth. And if you ask your grandmother or your great grandmother, they'd have told you that a long time ago. You can read all about it, uh, you know, all over the place. They're talking about it. I was just uh, recently reading The Catcher in, a, in the Rye again, and they talked about how this guy was too skinny, so they wanted to put him on a fattening diet with all starches and stuff. And it's like, huh, interesting. They knew how to fatten people up. Give them a lot of starch because you're going to get a lot of insulin effects. So it's like they knew that in the 1940s or whenever The Catcher in the Rye was written. You encounter it all over the place. If you're to ask you know, your great-grandmother, how do you lose weight? They go, oh, cut out the snacks, cut out the sugar. And to a large extent, that's exactly the same advice we have today. Now, everybody understands about the sugar, but this idea that you have to not eat all the time to allow your body to burn it off has somehow been lost in this idea that we have to eat six or 10 times a day. That was never based on science. There's no science that says eating 10 times a day is good for you. And nobody in the history of humanity has ever eaten six or eight times a day. It's always been two to three meals because we had work to do. You shared a story in the book of yourself as a child. I think you were 12 years old, and this was your first experience with fasting when you were going in to have a medical, actually two different medical procedures done. And obviously at the time, you probably didn't give it a lot of thought, but this was planted in your, in your psyche, we'll say, as your earliest uh, fasting experience. So what I'm curious is connecting the pieces here. You mentioned before being a kidney specialist the reason you got into fasting was the fact that you took it all the way back to the core and realized obesity was the problem that you're dealing with. But how do you personally put that piece together that fasting was the solution for obesity? Like what, what was it for you that turned you on to that idea? Well, it, it's sort of a natural extension of, uh, of the science of it, right? So if the idea is, hey, we need to have fasting periods. It's a cycle. It's feeding and fasting, right? That's where the word breakfast comes in, right? It's the meal that breaks your fast. If you don't fast, you can't break your fast. So therefore, what people had recognized, and it's the same in French, déjeuner means it's a word for breakfast and jeuner is the word to fast. So there's this idea that, of course, there's a time that you're going to eat, which is your feeding period. And during that time, insulin's high and you're storing calories. And then there's your sleeping and, you know, after dinner and before breakfast, that's your fasting period. And that's the time you're going to burn those calories, right? So it's this cycle. And as long as you keep those feeding and fasting periods in check, it's going to be relatively equal. So then uh, the idea is that if you now want to try and lose weight, then all you're going to need to do very simply is extend that fasting period to longer. Instead of 12 hours, you might go 16 hours or 24 hours. And of course, there's all kinds of people who, who come up with all these um, you know, reasons why people can't do it. And one of the most common concerns is that you're going to be hungry. And that was where that story came out of. So what happened was that I was about 12 years old and I had, a, I had an ulcer. So they were doing these gastroscopies and stuff to investigate why I was getting these problems. So in order to prep the colon, I had to fast for 24 hours. So nothing to eat. I would just drink water and you know that would allow me to clean out the colon so that they could see properly. And so everybody, my parents and I thought, wow, I'm going to be just like ravenously hungry. 
through this entire experience of, uh, I think it was, you know, the whole day of fasting. So it was like 36 hours of fasting, but I had to do it. So I did it. And what I thought was very strange was that I wasn't particularly hungry through the entire thing. Later on, like I found some studies and as I started to prescribe it to people, people have exactly the same experiences. So if you take a large group of people and you fast them over the whole day and you measure ghrelin, which is called the hunger hormone, what's interesting is that ghrelin peaks at sort of three times of the day. So breakfast, lunch, and dinner, you're going to get hungry. So ghrelin peaks, you get hungry. So the question is, what happens if you don't eat breakfast and you don't eat lunch and you don't eat dinner? What's interesting is that the ghrelin goes up and it doesn't keep going up. It actually peaks and then it falls and it falls right back to baseline. If you skip lunch, for example, you're working through lunch at one o'clock, one thirty, you're hungry. But by four o'clock, if you measure how full or hungry you are, you're about the same level whether you ate or you didn't eat. And that's a really interesting thing because if you think about it, what's happening in the body is that the body, sensing that you're not about to eat, has simply taken the calories that it's needed from your body fat. That is, it's opened up the stores of body fat. And now instead of getting you know, 800 calories from your lunch, it's taken those 800 calories from your body stores, which is body fat. Well, that's perfect. And if you fed yourself through that body fat, then why would you be hungry? You don't need those calories. Because everybody thinks that hunger is really a state of how long you've eaten. It's actually not true. If you look at the circadian rhythm of how hungry you are, and again, this is with large groups of people, on average, people are the least hungry at 8 a.m. and the most hungry at 8 p.m. If you think about it, 8 a.m. is usually the time of the day, the longest since you which ate, right? You've probably ate more than 12 hours ago. Your dinner, say you ate dinner at 8 p.m. At 8 a.m., You've gone 12 hours without eating, and yet you are the least hungry on average. 8 p.m., on the other hand, you probably ate, you know, just a few hours ago, you know, like at 12 or 1 or 2, so six hours ago you ate, and here you are, hungry again. So it's not the length of time since you've eaten that determines hunger. It's actually a hormonal state, and fasting actually does a lot of things And what's interesting is when you start going into extended fasting, like two, three days, what you find is ghrelin starts to go down over the number of days. So if you fast for one day, you have a certain level of hunger. Day two, day three, day four, actually, you get less and less and less hungry. And that's the secret to why people can fast for like seven days, 10 days, whatever. It's because their hunger has disappeared because now they're they're essentially feeding themselves on their body fat stores. I think that's just such an important point you highlighted there. The fact that this is basically a wave that comes through of hunger and understanding that would give somebody the psychological energy to maybe push through that and skip a meal and and to fast. Not knowing that they're going to think, oh, my body's telling me something and this must mean it needs food. But what you're saying is that's going to peak, come back down to baseline. And then even over the course of days, that's going to even go down even further. Yeah. Question for you though, but if somebody say skips their lunch and then they they fight through that first wave, are they going to have a second wave around dinner time, or will it kind of stay where it was when it came back to baseline? No, you get that second wave, so it will come. So you get these peaks. So if you don't eat breakfast, they'll peak, but then it'll go back to baseline. And then you'll get a lunch wave, and then you got a dinner wave. If you start going two, three, four days out, those waves start to go down. And I think a lot of it is anticipated. That is the reason we have three peaks is that people are used to eating three times a day. So if you take people who are, are, don't normally eat three times a day, I, my guess is that you wouldn't find those, those peaks. So if you look at people who skip breakfast, for example, there's a lot of people who skip breakfast just because they'd rather sleep kind of thing. What you find is that they're not that hungry. Most people who skip breakfast, like I, I don't eat breakfast in general, people find that they're just not hungry because they're not used to eating. So therefore, they don't get hungry until sort of the regular time, which is like 12 o'clock. So uh, it, a lot of it is sort of a learned uh, response. And yeah, and, and I agree with you. Knowing sort of the science of what happens takes away some of the fears that people have of, oh my God, I'm going to be so hungry. I'm going to be forced to go to the Krispy Kreme donuts kind of thing. And that's we have a, we have a program for people at thefastingmethod.com which is to sort of connect people and give them the information they need and build a community that's going to support each other. 
Another point that people always say is that, well, I'll never be able to do it. I like the idea, but I'll never be able to do it. It's like, well, if you think about society, there are periods of time where people fast. So if you take Lent, for example, in the Catholic religion, there are people who fast, like Good Friday, for example. The, during Ramadan in the Islam tradition, people fast on that day. On Yom Kippur, you know, and Buddhists have their traditions, Greek Orthodox have their traditions, Hindus have their traditions. So large numbers of people are able to fast successfully for literally their entire adult lives. And the key is, of course, is like anything else, if you have a group of supportive people around you, you can do anything. So if everybody around you is fasting because it's a Good Friday, well, it's not that hard to fast. It's not that much fun, but it's not that hard either. So that's the point of providing a supportive community, getting people to understand it, because it's not simply about, hey, you looking good for bikini season sort of thing. If that's all it was, I wouldn't be that interested in it. This has an impact on people's lives. That is, if you have weight to lose, if you develop type 2 diabetes, you've just put your risk of a heart attack up, a stroke, and cancer. Well, that's the top killers of Americans right there. And there's something we can do about it. You know, something like fasting, it's free. You can do it anytime you want. You can stop anytime you want. Nobody's making a profit off of you. You, you know, you can do it longer or shorter. It's totally within your control. So it's sort of the ultimate in terms of um, sort of hacking your way to a better life. And it's entirely natural, right? There's nothing unnatural about it. So if you think about how people used to talk about fast, it's about purification. It's about cleansing. It's about detoxification, right? That's how people used to talk about fasting. Now it's a, you know, it's a dirty word. It's the F word. Right? It's like, oh, you have to eat 10 times a day to be healthy. It's like, yes, even if you're like 500 pounds. Well, since you, you have all those calories on your body, why can't you naturally allow your body to use it? That's the question I have. And when you look in the literature, there actually is nothing unnatural about it. But by contrast, you're going to do a lot of good because as you lose weight, your diabetes is going to get better. Your risk of heart attacks is going to go down. 13 different types of cancer are considered obesity-related cancers, including breast and colorectal. So, you know, you're putting yourself at high, high risk by not fasting. Now I'm going to take a quick break from my chat with Jason to give a shout out to my show partner, Sun Warrior. Sun Warrior has created a clean and easy way to stay in ketosis with their unique protein blend and clean keto-supporting ingredients. Lose weight and improve energy levels, metabolism, and overall health with their expertly crafted clean keto protein peptide solution. This unique product contains fava bean, pea protein, peptides from rice, MCTs, and aquamin, which is a multi-mineral complex from marine algae. A few different ways you can use this product, you can use it to make smoothies, smoothie bowls, or you can shake it with your favorite nut milk and just drink that back, or you can take that boosted nut milk and pour it over your favorite grain-free cereal for a nutritional boost. To take advantage of your 20% listener discount, go to ultimahealthpodcast.com slash sunwarrior. Again, that URL is ultimahealthpodcast.com slash sunwarrior. On top of that, if you spend $50 or more, you get free shipping. And you don't need to be keto to enjoy the clean keto from Sun Warrior. It's a great addition to any healthy pantry. Now I'm going to give a shout out to my other show partner, Perfect Keto. Keto Krill oil is a great way to get some omega-3 fats and MCTs without the fishy aftertaste. Krill oil is from Antarctic Krill, and it's a rich source of omega-3 fats, which can help support healthy inflammation levels. Krill oil contains the healthy beneficial compound astaxanthin. MCTs are a unique type of fatty acid found in coconut oil that is metabolized quicker than the typical fats we get in our diet. MCTs provide a boost in ketones to help support mental clarity and focus. This product contains no added sugars, sugar alcohols, chemicals, gluten, dairy, soy, or corn. As a listener of the show, you get 20% off your order by going to ultimahealthpodcast.com slash perfectketo. Again, that's ultimahealthpodcast.com slash perfectketo. Perfect Keto products ship worldwide. If you live in the U.S., you get free shipping. Get yourself some of the Keto Krill Oil Soft Gels. They're an easy and tasteless way to get your omega-3s and MCTs in. Now back to my chat with Jason. Let's get into the physiology. So... You talked about skipping breakfast. Let's get into that example specifically. Say somebody 
has their last meal, their dinner around 7 p.m., and they wake up and they skip their breakfast. And this is totally new for them. And now their body is dealing with fasting state. So take us through the changes that start happening in the body. Obviously, we're not going to be spiking the insulin, but what else is happening there? Yeah, so there's a very well-defined change in the body that happens when you don't eat. So when you're eating, and if you're eating a very typical sort of high-carbohydrate diet, then your body will store the glucose as glycogen in the liver. So basically, it puts together all these chains of glucose, stores it as glycogen in the liver. And then after that, it stores body fat. So there's two sort of storage forms of energy, glycogen, which is sugar, and body fat. Um, as you fast, what happens is insulin starts to fall, and now you have to start using up those stores of energy that you've stored away, right? So you're going to start off with using the glycogen, which is sugar, because it's the easiest to get in and out, right? So you've got chains of glucose. So you simply chop up the chain, throw it out into the blood, and you've got energy. So it's easy to, to store it. It's easy to get it out, but there's a limited amount. So it's sort of like if you think about a food analogy, it's sort of like your refrigerator. You can put it in, you can take it out very easily. You know, you buy some lettuce, you put it in your fridge, take it out. Easy. But there's a limited storage space. So if you run out of storage space in your refrigerator, you go get yourself one of those basement chest freezers. So they're a lot harder to get to because if you have a frozen chicken or something, then you got to go downstairs, you got to defrost it and cook it. It's not so easy. You can't just take it out and eat it sort of thing. It's much harder to get to, but the advantage is there's unlimited storage space because you can get two or three chest freezers if you want. And that is the body fat. You know, when you think about it as a, as a logical problem, it's a two compartment problem. That is, you've got one compartment, which is the fridge, which is the same as the glycogen, which is easy to get to, but limited storage space. The other one is hard to get to, but unlimited storage space. So you see that they complement each other very, very well. So if you're trying to lose body fat, the problem is that you're, you need to start off with dealing with your first compartment, which is the glycogen. So one way to do that is a very low carbohydrate diet, for example. So a ketogenic diet, for example, tries to do that. It's a more extreme example. And what you do, of course, is that you have such low levels of carbohydrate that your body is mostly burning body fat. And therefore, you're kind of getting right into that fridge. Uh, You're skipping that fridge and going right to the freezer, which is the body fat. The other thing is fasting. It takes about 24 hours to get to a state where you've completely depleted your glycogen stores. And then after that, you're going to get a little bit of uh, protein that's going to be used to turn into glucose, and that's called gluconeogenesis from about 20 to 30 hours. And everybody thinks that's a bad thing, but it's not. So when you're using up protein, what happens is that it's not muscle. There's a lot of excess protein when you're overweight, and that's skin and connective tissue and all that. And then you get into the fat burning because once you've gone through that, So as insulin falls, the other thing that happens is other hormones tend to go up. And these are called the counter-regulatory hormones. So uh, those hormones include growth hormone, for example, as well as noradrenaline, increased sympathetic nervous system, and cortisol. So basically, when you think about what's happening during fasting, your body's not shutting down. It's actually turning itself up. It's amping itself up. Because if you think about the, uh, you know, noradrenaline and the sympathetic nervous system, that's your fight or flight response. So that actually activates the body. So when you're hungry, you're not actually tired. You're actually dialed in. And that's one of the reasons that people have more energy when they fast, because it's a natural response. And you might think, well, if you're not having energy, why is your body sort of ramping itself up? And it probably has to do with a survival response. Imagine you're like a caveman, for example, and it's winter and there's nothing to eat. If your body starts shutting down, it's going to be even harder to go out and get food. And then the next day, it's even harder and harder. So you're going to die and we wouldn't be here. Uh, So what your body does instead, the body's just not that stupid. What it does instead is it simply switches its fuel sources from food to body fat. Then it increases the amount of energy that it has. Increases sympathetic nervous system, increases, um, you know, noradrenaline to give you energy to go out there and hunt that woolly mammoth. So that's why if you think about people say, oh, I can't concentrate. Well, actually, you get more concentration during fasting or, oh, I get tired. 
you know, think about the last time you had a huge Thanksgiving meal. Were you really sharp mentally or did you just want to sit down and watch some football? If you're thinking about animals, like would you rather face like a hungry wolf or the lion who just ate? Well, that hungry wolf is much more dangerous because it's dialed in. It's got energy. If you're hungry for something, you really want to go get it. So it's giving you energy. So that's the physiology of what happens during fasting. So these are all great things. And then the growth hormone is the other thing. So as you burn off some of that protein, the growth hormone is going to, when you start to eat again, rebuild all the proteins that you need. So it's actually something that um, you know people in longevity talk about because what you're doing is you're breaking down the proteins that are not necessary and then the growth hormone is going to rebuild the proteins that you need. That's a complete cycle of rejuvenation. That is, if you want to um, you know, renovate your bathroom, for example, the first step is not to build something. The first step is to rip out all the old you know, avocado green tub that you had in there because you can't put in a new thing until you've ripped out that old stuff. So the first cycle of regeneration for the body is actually to break down all the crud that's there first. You got to get rid of it and then you can rebuild. And that's why fasting is so powerful, not only for disease prevention and weight loss and diabetes, but also for longevity. Well, while we're talking about breaking down, let's talk about autophagy and, and how this impacts the body. And at what point do we get into this? Yeah, so autophagy is perfect for uh, fasting. So what happens in autophagy? So autophagy is this process that's actually uh, seen in you know every living thing from yeast on up sort of thing. And it's where you, your body actually um, breaks down sort of old subcellular parts and recycles them. So the point is that what this does is it, it's triggered by lack of protein. So if you eat practically anything, it will turn off autophagy. So if you're eating all the time, you're going to turn off autophagy right off. That problem is that if you don't break down those subcellular parts, which are all junky, you can't build new ones. So that's why the 2016 Nobel Prize in Medicine was actually given to one of the first researchers in autophagy. And uh, fasting is really the, the most reliable way to get into autophagy. And it's not a permanent state. It's just a way of sort of breaking down these old cells. Because when your body senses that there's no nutrients coming in, it wants to get rid of all the extraneous cells, right? Because it's facing a stress that, hey, there's not enough food coming in. Therefore, let's get rid of all these extra cells that we don't need because we can only preserve what we need, right? So getting rid of all the extra stuff that you don't want. So that's a very important thing because it's only by, you know, it's just like cleaning out, like spring cleaning for your house. First thing to do is throw out all the junk you've accumulated in your basement. Like that's what's going to do you more good than buying new stuff right, is to throw out all the old stuff. And that's what autophagy is. It's sort of a spring cleaning for your body. What's really interesting to me is that when you go back and think about how people thought about fasting, they had exactly the right idea. They're talking about detoxification, cleansing, and purification. That's what fasting was. And in fact, that's exactly what's happening on a subcellular level. They just didn't know what they're describing at the time. But it's fascinating that people already sort of instinctively knew there was something sort of healing about this. And it's not that you do it all the time, because remember, obesity is very rare and, you know, before 1970. But there was something very, very good about fasting. And that's the reason you see it in almost every major religion. That's so interesting. And when it comes to men versus women, are there differences that happen in the body during a fast or special considerations if a man versus a woman is going to take on fasting? There are certain differences. Um, men tend to lose weight a little bit faster in the beginning and then slow down. Women tend to start slower and then sort of but keep on it longer. So in the end, it's about the same. Most studies of fasting show that you get about the same level of weight loss uh, day after day. The, the thing is that a lot of men's metabolic rates are much higher. So therefore, when you go to zero, then they're going to lose weight sort of a little bit faster. You know, if you do fasting, you have to understand that there's an initial, generally an initial rapid period of weight loss for the first couple of days. And that's a lot of it is water weight, because as your insulin starts to fall, 
insulin tends to hold water. So you actually start to pee out water. So if you, some people notice that they're peeing a lot in the first few days. And that's the body getting rid of some of the water. And of course, that's very heavy. So you'll see on the scale when you measure it that your weight has gone down very significantly. Um, so the average weight loss for fasting is about a half a pound per day, which is not a lot. So if you think about it, a pound of fat is roughly 3,600 calories. If you're burning about 1,800 calories a day, it's a half a pound of fat for one fasting day. So if you were to fast for, say, four days, it's like how much body fat will you lose? About two pounds. That's it. You'll probably lose like five or six pounds. But then you have to understand that the excess above two is probably water. So if you eat again and drink again, then you'll regain like three or four pounds, right? So if you're fasting for four days, you lose six pounds and gain four back. That's what you expect to happen. But a lot of people say, oh, I lost six and then I gained it all back. It's like, well, you have to understand what's happening here. That, a lot of that was water weight. So, so not to be discouraged by that sort of uh, thing. Yeah, and realizing ahead of time that this is a long-term game. It's a lifestyle. It's not a quick fix. Yeah, exactly. So coming back to what we talked about before with the snacking, this is obviously the first step towards somebody fasting where they're giving up snacking and they're going to have three square meals a day. So let's talk about the insulin, how it's going to dip there in between those three square meals and talk about when somebody will actually get into burning some fat. So say somebody's eating a breakfast at, they're not fasting yet, but they're going to have breakfast at 8 a.m., have lunch at 1 and dinner at 6 p.m. How much fat are they going to get if they're not snacking in between those meals? How much are they going to burn? Yeah, but it takes about, say, three to four hours uh, for your, you know, so glucose rises, insulin rises after a meal. Depends on how big the meal is, of course. And then it starts to fall. So if you eat a very small meal, it might only be go up for one or two hours. If you eat sort of a big breakfast or whatever, it might go up and last for three, four hours. By that time, it's going to start to go down and then you're going to start using up some of the calories that you stored, both glycogen and body fat. So during that period of eating, that's when you're going to mostly stay in the sort of, because it's three, four hours, if you go eight to one, you know, you'll maybe get into some fat burning by 12, but then by one, you're going to eat again. So that's why people talk about sort of compressing their eating windows, which is called time-restricted eating. So instead of eating sort of from eight till eight, you'll eat from say, you know, noon till like eight o'clock or something like that just compressing that eating window a little bit so that you are spending more time where your insulin levels are falling. So that's a very popular schedule called 16-8, where you have eight hours of eating and 16 hours of fasting every day. That way, when you consolidate it by three, four hours after your last meal, you're starting to dip into those reserves of energy. And then therefore, if you eat a relatively low carbohydrate diet, you're going to start using body fat because you're not you don't have enough glucose to, to uh, burn. So when we're kicking snacking to the curb and, and we're trying to have these three square meals or if we're getting into fasting, what things that we're consuming, what can we consume, I should say, other than water that is going to keep us in that state of fat burning and, and eventually fasting? So anything that um, has sort of carbohydrate or protein is going to raise insulin. Dietary fat doesn't really. But uh, you can use things other than water. You can use things like tea. So I, I um, think that green tea in particular is very effective for fasting, uh, but also black teas and coffee as well. But green tea has uh, certain chemicals called catechins, which do tend to suppress the appetite a little bit. And there's a bit of caffeine to keep the metabolic rate up a little bit. So there's a couple of benefits of green tea specifically. And there's also, you can get these fasting teas. I work with a company called Peak Tea to make some fasting teas because those are very good. They come in, you know, you get all these different flavors. And the other thing is it gives you something to do sort of thing, right? So when you're fasting, if it's lunchtime, you're going to get hungry, right? You're going to get this wave. You want to try and ride out that wave. So you need something to do. Uh, if you're busy at work, sure, you can probably get through it. But the other thing to do is go get yourself sort of a big cup of, you know, fasting tea or something like that, green tea, and just drink it. And by the time you finish that, most of the hunger will have sort of died away. And that's one sort of way to kind of get through it because you have to anticipate that these things are going to happen. You are going to get hungry. And how are you going to respond to it? 
If you're doing it for autophagy, then it's a little different. Then you probably have to stick to water only. But otherwise, uh, you know, most uh, teas, coffees are okay. Uh, no sugar in the coffee. And, you know, a little bit of cream is probably okay in the uh, coffee if you like that. Then you get into the more lenient fasts, which include things like bone broth, which again, have, have calories, there's proteins and all that. But the key is that fasting is not this sort of all or nothing. It's about as your insulin levels start to fall, if you take a little bit of bone broth, for example, you'll bring it up a little bit and then it'll start to just go back down. The things that you want to avoid is sweeteners. So sugar, of course. But also most artificial sweeteners are not very good for you. So, um, and people say, why is that? Well, you know, there's a lot of reasons, but the bottom line is that they don't really work for weight loss. That is, if, you know, those artificial sweeteners were so good for weight loss, that is, you replace sugar with some chemical that happens to be sweet and not kill you, then we would have all been skinny already. We would have just all drank diet soda, ate sugar-free cookies eat sugar-free ice cream, and we'd be like, fine, right? But it doesn't help anybody. Like, when's the last time somebody said, oh, yeah, I just switched to Diet Coke and lost 25 pounds? It's like, that never happens. And, you know, you can debate the reasons why, but ultimately, it doesn't really work. And I think it's because when you start taking a lot of sweet things, then you start to crave a lot of sweet things. And then that's going to make the fasting just a lot harder for you. So I know so many people who, um, you know, they came in, they said, yeah, my doctor said diet sodas were okay. So they, and then they weren't losing weight. They had trouble fasting. And they're like, yeah, as soon as I stopped that, you know, diet soda, everything sort of fell into place. And it's like, and then you say, okay, how many were you drinking? It's like, yeah, 10 a day or something like that. So it's like, those things are kind of detrimental. One a day is probably okay, but you don't want to, you don't want to get into the, the idea that these things are okay for you. I think they make you crave uh, sweet things. That's my own feeling about it. That's the main thing. If you have to even do a little bit of like bulletproof coffee or something, which is very popular, you can still get good results with that. So, th- you know, those are what I call fasting variations. That is, they're not true fast and that they're not water only fast, but you can still get really, really good results with them. And if you're having great results, then don't knock it. You don't have to kill yourself. Now I'm going to take another quick break from my chat with Jason to give a shout out to my show partner, Paleo Valley. The turmeric complex from Paleo Valley is part of my daily supplement stack. I love including turmeric into my diet any way I can, but what I love about this product is its insurance that I'm getting some in on a daily basis. The supplement supports brain health, cardiovascular function, and the immune system, and also helps fight inflammation. It contains organic turmeric, ginger, rosemary, and cloves. It also contains organic coconut oil and black pepper for absorption. Each bottle is a 30-day supply and easy to swallow veggie caps, and it's 100% pure, no fillers or flow agents. To take advantage of your listener discount, which is 15% off, go to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash paleovalley. Again, that's ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash paleovalley. Get yourself some of this powerful organic blended turmeric and three more inflammation-fighting superfoods. Now I'm going to give a shout out to my other show partner, Organifi. Organifi's green juice powder contains superfoods to fuel your immunity. It's organic, gluten-free, soy-free, vegan, and keto-friendly. The ingredients include moringa, chlorella, mint, spirulina, beets, matcha green tea, wheatgrass, ashwagandha, and turmeric. It's loaded. To consume, you just take a scoop, mix it with some clean water, and it's ready to drink. This product isn't a replacement to consuming greens. You should still get plenty of whole food greens through smoothies, salads, and more. But this green juice powder is a great adjunct to an already healthy diet. As a listener of the show, you get 20% off your Organifi purchase by going to ultimahealthpodcast.com slash Organifi. Again, that's ultimahealthpodcast.com slash Organifi. And Organifi is spelled O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I. Up your consumption of greens with the green juice powder from Organifi. And now back to my chat with Jason. And important to note too is stevia is something you talk about in the book and how this actually raises insulin. And that's often considered a healthy sweetener in the health and wellness space. So people need to make note of that. Yeah. I mean, in general, I think the sweeteners are sort of a bit oversold. These newfangled things like this natural, right? Stevia is natural, but you know, I'm always a little bit suspicious because it's like, okay, here you have stevia, which is 
you know, uh, from a leaf. It's like, what are the chances that for the last 5,000 years, we all sort of forgot about stevia and all of a sudden in 2012 or whenever it became popular, we just discovered that it was, you know, there's a super food here. <laughs> it's like, I don't think that's really going to happen, that we'd somehow missed it all for five or 6,000 years of human history. So it's more like, well, you know, it was there all along, but uh, and it's not that good for you, but, you know, you can sell it. I think that the, the problem is that the sweetness just makes you want to eat. So if you think about how the body works, it's like if you think about an appetizer, it's a small portion of food that makes you hungrier, okay? Because once you start eating, you're going to want to eat, right? That's the whole idea between behind an appetizer. So if you drink something that's sweet, you're going to activate all the signals that make you want to eat because your body's like, hey, bring it on. <laughs> like we're getting ready to eat over here, right? So it's really acting like an appetizer and you don't want it to because you want to stay in that zone where your body doesn't think it's getting food. So it's the same thing with eating six times a day. Like it's complete madness. Because it's like a lot of these things, it's like my son, right? It's like you can't get him into the bath. And once he's in the bath, you can't get him out of the bath, right? So there's not this natural inertia. The body's the same. When it's not eating, it can stay in that state. Like when you're fasting, you can stay in there a long time. Once you start eating, then you're going to want to eat, right? It's like here it comes. So if you're going to eat six or eight times a day, what you're doing is giving yourself an appetizer, making yourself hungry and want to eat more. And then deliberately stopping and then doing the same thing over and over six or eight times a day. It's like, why would you want to do that? Right? A it recipe makes no for sense. disaster. Yeah. It's, it's absolutely a recipe for disaster. And I don't know where that idea came from. And people need to consider too, even things like sometimes I'll make a juice during the day in between meals. And, and this is still going to have an impact on insulin. And in my opinion, that would be considered a snack too, right? Absolutely. So if it's sweet and your body recognizes it as food or then it's going to make you want to eat just like an appetizer. So, you know, and it's not something that is part of the way uh, we grew up up until the 1960s, 1970s. And I choose 1960, 1970 because it's sort of 1977 was sort of the beginning of the obesity epidemic. And if you look in the 60s, there's very little obesity, but you have to recognize that people were still eating sort of meat and potatoes, they're eating white bread, they're eating ice cream, they're eating cookies, they're just not eating all the time. And that's the big difference. That eating in your car is not, you know, that's, you don't do that sort of thing, right? If you wanted to eat at your, at your desk at work in 1960, people would be like, who the heck is this guy? Like, how rude eating, you know, when you're walking, like that, all that is like, no, you can't do that. There's a time for eating, breakfast, lunch, dinner, no other time. Including drinks. Yeah, and including drinks and so on, like the smoothies and stuff, because that's really like a food. And, and so that kept people, despite a variation, you know, the Irish are eating their potatoes, the Chinese are eating their rice, and, you know, Mexicans are eating beans, and Americans are eating pizza and french fries and burgers like it didn't matter what food they ate as long as you're not eating all the time as long as you have sort of defined feeding periods plus a defined fasting period right that's the breakfast you know that's the word that's the english language is telling you that's the sort of primal importance of that fasting period as long as you have sort of defined eating periods defined fasting periods you're probably going to do okay i know for myself that's going to be the biggest takeaway because i've often fallen into the trap of grabbing a handful of nuts or a healthy bar in between meals. And, you yeah. know, I'm just going to have to, if I feel that hunger come on, like we talked about earlier, I have to just wait out that wave and realize it'll pass. And, and having all this information that you're providing is just going to, you know, provide the strength to realize that it's, it's just a feeling. It's not just the willpower, so to speak. It's also the environment. Because if you think about work, for example, because a lot of us work during the day. Um, if you have, say you have a meeting at say two o'clock or something like that, or you have a meeting at 1030, uh, you know, you go to the boardroom, there's a bunch of other people. In the 1960s, you sit around, you have your meeting. In the 2020, you sit, at, well, not 2020, but 2019 and before COVID, you'd go there and somebody would order a plate of bagels. 
right? And it's like, okay, so now you're sitting there, you're bored out of your mind, and you're going to grab a bagel because you have nothing better to do, and it's staring you at you in the face. Or, you know, at 2.30, somebody's got cookies out, right? And it's like, okay, so now you're not hungry, and you would never walk out of your meeting to go get yourself a bagel because it's rude. But now you've sort of, the environment has sort of enabled you to eat when you would not have otherwise eaten. Same with school, like these mid-morning snacks and the after-school snacks. It's like, okay, why do we need after-school snacks? Entire generations of kids grew up eating lunch and eating dinner, right? It's like, all of a sudden, we can't go the six hours between 12 and 6 o'clock? Like, that's ridiculous. Like, why do we need it, right? So the, the environment that we're in has enabled us to eat all the time and actually encouraged us to eat all the time because by making it easy, which is good news because if you know that, you simply say, like, honestly, if I was a, you know, a manager in a company, I would simply say, you know what? There's no food in the company. Like, there's a cafeteria for you to eat. Don't put chocolates on your desk. We're not ordering cookies. We're not ordering bagels in the meetings, right? And because it's not fair to all those people trying to lose weight. And it's an important health issue. That's what I would say. And you would instantly take away the entire source of temptation for people to eat. If you didn't have those nuts available, you'd never eat them, right? So if you're in a, you know, in the 60s, you're in the in a meeting and you're working all day, you would never eat nuts because they're just not available to you. And when somebody starts playing with this and skipping snacking and maybe delving into fasting a little bit, does it become easier over time? Does the body get used to this? Totally. So once you get used to it, it's actually, it's really easy. And that's where a lot of doctors, when I started talking, people were like, you know, a lot of the people were like, I don't know about this, but the doctors immediately got it because they're like, you know what? I used to do that all the time when I was in medical school, didn't have time to eat. I would go like 24 hours without eating never notice the difference. So they would sort of instantly understand what I was talking about. That is the body is essentially feeding itself. You don't have, like the body's not that stupid. It will take care of you, assuming you have body fat, right? But the doctors would be like, yeah, I did that. And look, now I eat all the time and I've gained like 50 pounds and I can't lose it. It's like, and, and why can't you fast? It's something that has been done for thousands of years without problem. That is, it's in the Bible, it's in the Quran, it's you know part of the Buddhist traditions, Hindu traditions. It's uh, you know, it's everywhere. People have been fasting for thousands of years, and now suddenly, since 1980, we're not able to do it anymore. It's like, no, of course not. That's ridiculous. So, from a physiologic standpoint, they immediately see there's actually nothing wrong with doing it. They themselves had done it all along and never really even noticed it because they're so busy doing whatever work they're doing, that they didn't even notice their hunger. They didn't even notice that anything was going on. So they knew that nothing bad would happen. That is, I tell people to fast all the time. If they have to get blood work, you have to fast. So if people fast, and guess what? Nothing bad happens. What about exercising in a fasted state? Say you're somebody who's testing this out and skipping breakfast, so a shorter fast. Is this something safe or recommended? So again, assuming you're not one of these, um, you know, super, super endurance athletes and so on, and you don't have like, you know, 5% body fat or something, then yeah, it's not going to be a problem to do, it's called training in the fasted state. So there's actually a number of advantages of of, uh, this. And one of them is that the way you generally do it is you fast, you know, 16 hours, 20 hours, then you do your exercise, then you eat sometime afterward you're fasted, you're training in the fasted state and then eating afterwards. So the advantage is, of course, that as you're fasting, other hormones like growth hormone goes up and sympathetic nervous system and uh, noradrenaline go up. So in fact, because you're activating your body, you can actually train harder. Because you have growth hormone, you're going to recover faster. So that's a huge advantage if you're training, because now you, what you're doing is that you're working harder you got the growth hormone to repair, and then you eat after your exercise, so you get protein and all that you need to build the muscle. You're sort of hacking your body to actually work out better. What are the biggest challenges you're seeing with people when they're just starting out fasting, and what do you do to help them through those? There's a lot of little things that come up when you're fasting. 
it's one, knowing what's about to happen is important because if you know you're going to get hungry, you can prepare for it. If you know there are other things like headaches and diarrhea sometimes and, you know, this and that, uh, cramps, then you know how to do it. So that's what we try to do at thefastingmethod.com uh, is sort of give people the information they need so that they know what to expect. If you don't know what to expect, then you're going to, you know, um, have a tough time. So the biggest challenge is sort of those little things that sort of come up and not knowing the, you know, how to deal with them. So getting proper information, because it's not easy to find these days. And second is having a supportive environment. Because again, if you are fasting and everybody you know is telling you that you're going to kill yourself, it's not easy to continue. So you have to have a supportive environment. And to some extent, it's changing because the public perception of fasting has changed so dramatically since I started doing it about six years ago. When I started talking about it six or seven years ago, like everybody thought I was crazy. Like, honestly, it was like universal. <laughs> it's like, ah, oh, you're going to kill people. You're going to kill people. And now it's, it's sort of well understood. People are, are thinking about it, talking about it. It's actually in 2019, it was, pro it was the most Googled diet trend was intermittent fasting. So people are thinking about it and seeing the logic behind it, but not just the logic, but the fact that it has been in sort of continuous use because it's literally the oldest dietary intervention in history. Seeing that it has this sort of proven success and saying, well, if I don't eat, well, I'm going to burn body fat. That's what I have. That's why I have body fat. So logically, that makes sense. And then doing it and finding that it's not as hard as they had imagined. Seeing such a dramatic change just in six years in people's mentality towards fasting, where do you see things going over the next six to 10 years? I mean, obviously, a lot of people are looking at it, but it's very slow to catch on in the sort of medical professions, and that's starting to change as well. So just in 2020, January, it was sort of featured in the New England Journal of Medicine, which is a very prominent journal for doctors, talking about a lot of the advantages of it. So people are starting to think about it, um, but it's really being held back because a lot of medical professionals are still very much against it. Until we get that change, it's still going to take a little bit of time. But, you know, I'm hopeful because it really has come a long, long way. I mean, it's uh, in, in a few years. I mean, I wrote The Complete Guide to Fasting in 2000. It was released in 2016. At the time, it was completely like on the edge. And now you can see it everywhere. They talk about it in magazines and books and podcasts and so on. And like you talked about earlier, it's just so simple to do. It doesn't cost any money. You don't need any fancy tools. It's something that somebody who's totally new to this and is listening to what we're sharing today can decide tomorrow or tonight they're going to take this on and implement it right away. Absolutely. And it doesn't mean you have to fast for 40 days and 40 nights. I mean, if you decide, okay, I'm just going to start by fasting from, say, 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. That's a 12-hour fast. I'm going to start with that because that's pretty much what I do now. Well, great. The next day, you could say, okay, I'm going to push it out a little bit. I'm going to go till 9 a.m. That's a 14-hour fast. So you don't have to start by going like days and days on end. You can just gradually build it up. It's completely flexible. And then if the next day you have a breakfast meeting, then you don't have to do it the next day. Just wait till the next day. There's always more you can do. And so there's so many uh, you know, advantages to fasting because it's not something that you're doing to make your life complicated. It's something that you do to make your life simpler, easier. Right? It doesn't take time. It actually saves you time. It doesn't take money. It actually saves you money. Right? It makes you feel better getting healthy and practically getting paid to do it. Yeah, saving money on food. And like it's mentioned in the book, the first step is actually to just stop snacking. So before we even get into fasting, the first step towards fasting is like we've been hammering through this whole interview, just having those breaks between your meals and having three solid meals a day. So I think that'd be a great starting point for a lot of people. Yeah, absolutely. And then that's a sort of bringing us back to a sort of 1970s eating style where, you know, without even thinking about diets, because the diet industry was very small at that time, without even thinking about their diets, people just sort of effortlessly maintain their weight. Now, of course, it seems impossible to do, but the key was that the environment that they were in did not encourage them to eat between meals, and it didn't encourage them to eat after dinner. Three meals a day, no snacks, that's it. 
And I know we're all different and we all have different goals, but I'm just curious, what does your current fasting protocol look like? It changes. So a lot of times I don't eat breakfast. So I am sort of in that 16, eight most of the time. And um, I stopped eating breakfast sort of in medical school. And it wasn't because I was trying to lose weight is because I was tired and wanted to sleep and wanted to get up five minutes before I had to be in hospital. So I couldn't do that if I was eating breakfast. So I'd like roll out of bed, brush my teeth and walk into hospital. So it was more laziness than anything else. And then you get used to it and then you don't want it. You're not hungry. That's the thing. It's like, I'm not hungry during breakfast time. So why am I eating? Most of my days are sort of 16 hours fast. And then often I'll throw in some 24 hour fast a couple of times a week. Again, working through lunch gives you the advantage of having extra time. Then I can either go home early or I can do things like podcasts and stuff. And then uh, once in a while, usually after like holidays where I will not watch my diet very closely, then I'll have gained a bit of weight and then I'll do a longer fast. So, you know, either more extra 24 hour fast or like a three or five day fast, something like that. That's not all the time, but once in a while I'll do that just to sort of get myself caught up quickly. It's very uh, rewarding because if you go on, I remember I did this a few years ago when I went on a cruise. It was very interesting. And you know how everybody eats way too much and way too much of the wrong foods on a cruise. Well, I did that too. So that's fine. But and my pants were starting to get kind of tight. So I threw in a couple of 24-hour fasts and I did, I think, a two or three or four-day fast. And by the end of that week, I was sort of back to the pants were fitting normally and my weight was back to my usual weight. So it's like, oh, that's really powerful. Because I didn't have to be that guy on the cruise that says, I don't eat this, I don't eat this, give me some salad. I didn't have to be that. I really just ate whatever I want. And then I was able to make up for it by, you know, doing a little bit more fasting. So I had a great vacation. And then I just did a bit more fasting, which I didn't find that difficult. And I was back to baseline. So it it gives you this powerful tool for you to say, okay, well, if I gain too much weight, I can do something about it something concentrated like a longer fast or multiple 24-hour fast in a row that I can get myself back down very quickly. And it is just such a powerful tool knowing that if for some reason you need to work through your lunch or you need to skip a meal for whatever reason, just knowing going through it one or even a couple few times that you're going to be okay. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. And Jason, other than listeners getting a copy of your latest book, Life in the Fasting Lane, how can they connect with you after the show? We have a website called thefastingmethod.com where there's, um, you know, there's uh, blogs, there's articles, there's links to the, the YouTube videos, um, which I have. And then there's a paid program as well uh, on Twitter. My handle is at Dr. Jason Fung. So that's uh, a great place to connect as well. All right. Thank you. It's all going to be linked up in the show notes and really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed talking fasting with Jason. I hope you enjoyed it as well. I'd love to hear your thoughts over on Instagram. You can tag Dr. Jason Fung and Ultimate Health Podcast. You can take a screenshot of the player as you're listening. You can take a picture of yourself or a short video, and we'd love to connect with you over there. For full show notes, head over to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash 369. We have links there to everything we discussed today and so much more, so be sure and check that out. And before I let you go, I want to give some love to my editor and engineer, Jace Sanderson over at podcasttech.com. Jace, thank you so much for all the hard work you put in. It's much appreciated. And this week's fun fact is that Marnie's parents came in to visit us from Toronto this past weekend, and we had such a nice visit. Family time is always my top priority. Have an awesome week. Talk soon. Wishing you ultimate health.